Welcome to Beyond the Radio Dial, a wireless innovation forum podcast about the importance of radio spectrum for everyday life. I'm Stephanie Hamill, Marketing Director for the Forum. Beyond the Radio Dial is hosted by Andy Clegg, Wind Forum's Chief Technology Officer and self-described spectrum nerd. Now, here's Andy. Okay, well, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, This episode of Beyond the Radio Dial focuses on something that all of us use every single day, uh, whether we realize it or not, and that's GPS, uh, which actually means Global Positioning System. It's a constellation of satellites in the sky that provides some very critical services to the military, public safety, businesses, and most importantly, to us regular people. Uh, So to take a closer look at GPS, uh, we will find our way over to Lisa Dyer. She's the (laughs) Executive Director of the GPS Innovation Alliance. Uh, The Alliance promotes and enhances the uses of GPS and other global navigation satellite systems to benefit their members, customers, and users who live, work, and travel globally. So first, Lisa, thank you very much for joining Beyond the Radio Dial. Uh, Thank you for having me, Andy and Stephanie. It's just an honor to be here, and, and I love talking about GPS, so Hold on. Here we go. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, so let's get right to the questions. That's that's yeah. good. So, can you know, we may some of us may be aware of uh, some of the ways we use GPS, but probably not aware of all of the ways we rely on GPS. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the ways we rely on GPS? Yeah, absolutely. So, first and foremost, it is a system operated by the Department of Defense, and DoD and its allies use it for precision targeting. No one wants to go into conflict. No one wants to go to war. But if they do, precision targeting helps them to minimize civilian casualties and damage to infrastructure. The airline and the uh, general aviation community, those people flying the small planes, actually rely on it for navigation. And at large airports, it helps air traffic control bring planes closer together as they're approaching landing not for landing, but as they're approaching. And what that does is it allows airlines and airplane pilots to save fuel, be more efficient, and reduce the amount of time to travel between destinations. Hopefully that then returns a lower ticket price to you as the consumer. One of the areas that I don't know that people are that aware of is actually in our infrastructure, our physical infrastructure. So whether it's funded by the federal highway funds or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, nearly every project will be realized with the help of GPS. Whether it's surveyors standing on the side of the road with that funky equipment that they have, trying to figure out where exactly to place those roads, where to place buildings, bridges, et cetera or it is uh, the digital construction units that have both of these receivers and they are uh, grading the sites precisely where they need to go. So the faster they can do it, the less time we're sitting in traffic waiting for the roads to be repaired and the faster we're able to enjoy the benefits of those investments in in our infrastructure. And then one of the most critical, and I'll stop after this one, I promise, is actually in the 911 system. Um, today, the way that 911 calls are routed is someone places a call and it goes to the nearest cell tower. That cell tower can actually be within t- uh, 10 miles radius of an actual dispatching unit that helps get the call to the right place. The FCC actually just issued a report and order that says, hey, wireless companies, you are going to start implementing what's called location-based routing. And one of the reasons that they did this is that Nina, the 911 Association, pointed out that more than 80% of 911 calls are placed from cell phones, actually. And so this location-based routing order will have two two major advances. One, they're going to be uh, deciding routing it based on the location of the device where the call is being placed. Um, And two, in 24 months, they will have a text to 911 capability. Now, I will say that 24 months sounds like a long time if you are someone like Gabby Wong's parents. Gabby is has started a nonprofit called Access SOS. Her father, who is deaf, was was experiencing a medical emergency at home, and he was unable to communicate with 911. 
they threw out their TTY equipment, that old equipment that used to be ways for deaf and hard of hearing people to communicate with others telephonically a long time ago, Gabby said. And he ended up having to drive himself to the hospital mm -hmm. in the middle of a medical emergency to get the care he needed because he couldn't communicate. So she's created an app that is transmitting the location of the device to 911 so that they can get emergency services to people who are deaf of heart and hearing faster. Uh, what an incredible story. I highly recommend you look up Access SOS, but it's one of those critical ways that you just don't think about it when you're trying, you're in the middle of an emergency, you're not thinking GPS is helping me here, right? Yeah. So those yeah. are some, some of the really important ways that GPS is a part of our lives today. Yeah, interesting. A critical application, and you know, people think about all sorts of ways that GPS that they use it for, you know, navigation in the car and stuff. But some of these other areas that are in in a, in a lot of ways even more critical. It's fascinating to know that GPS plays a role. Um, so, you know, you gave us some of the big picture items that GPS is used for. Um, you know, I happen to know there's a lot of cool little niche areas that GPS is also used mm -hmm. for. Can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, well, I am from Missouri. I'm a sports fan. And, and so one of the, you know, go, go Kansas City. Uh, one of the great things that's you that is used is um, you'll see, of course, everybody's familiar with Garmin and Apple watches that track how well you're performing, etc. Right. But there are also these devices that you'll see um, if you watch Welcome to Wrexham or you see any you go to training camps for football, for American football, you'll see players wearing these um, sort of mini sports bras. They have tucked in the back between their shoulder blades these devices that are tracking their performance using GPS. And it's used not only for, you know, how far, how fast, et cetera, but it's also a really great tool for injury prevention and recovery to see how fast someone is um, getting better and, and improving. So cool for the sports fans out there. Very cool. I'm also really excited about its application in humanitarian demining. There are so many places around the world where conflict has left unexploded ordnance. And in a lot of those places, it is actual farmland. So um, the faster that you can demine those particular fields and where all that unexploded ordnance is, you can return it back to the civilian population and they can start feeding themselves, feeding their neighbors. And there are some really cool research technologies out there of putting GPS enabled sensors on drones to help detect if there is actually a mine or other some other form of unexploded ordnance underneath it. Hmm. And wow, how valuable that is to feeding people around the world when we can return those particular fields to agricultural purposes, for instance. Wow. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, lots, lots of really cool GPS applications that we don't think about. Um, especially, you know, for people who are younger than I am who've grown up, you know, not knowing when the, before there was a GPS and things like that. It's, it's, it's kind of cool how much we rely on it now. So for the layperson, maybe we should back up just a little bit. Um, could you give us a kind of an overall idea of how GPS actually works? Yeah. And very much the layperson, all of the engineers out there will be cringing when they hear me say this, but um, there above us, 20,000 kilometers above us is a constellation of 31 satellites constantly orbiting the Earth. And these satellites are also constantly transmitting signals down to the ground. Um, the signals are coming to help you figure out where you're located on the Earth, how to navigate, where you need to go. And also they're giving you some pretty precise timing signals as well that we can talk about later as well. But again, these are one-way signals that are transmitted to the ground to receivers that are listening and hearing those signals and then turning it into useful information that you and I can use. Or it's being paired with other sensor data I like to say it's the Mr. Rogers of technologies. It works well by itself, but it works really well with others. It plays well with others. Yeah. And it is, it's it's an extraordinary thing that these receivers can do to deliver valuable products to you and I as a consumer, to public safety, 
all sorts of different applications, some of which we've already talked about. Um, it, it's, it's just amazing technology. It's really, yeah. it's really cool to talk very about. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, can you give us a little bit of the history of, you know, I was talking a little while ago, people have grown up now, not not knowing a time before there was GPS, but can you give a little history of uh, how GPS started? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will have to start off by saying bravo to the military for making this a reality. Back in uh, 1973, a really crucial decision was made in December of 1973. It was we are going to go with a particular design for this system and we are going to fund it. It translates to roughly a billion dollars a day to start with these satellites. Wow. And what an extraordinary investment. As stewards of US taxpayer dollars, DOD had a winner with this one. This system um, is now returning one point seven has returned $1.7 trillion back to the US economy. Um, and that's in, in 2023 dollars. And that number just keeps climbing every single day. Um, and there are more than 6.5 billion devices out there. And that's because of the brilliance of a group of people who have been highlighted in two GPS World articles. I'll direct your viewers and listeners to those two articles in May and June of 2010. It's titled uh, Heroes, aptly titled Heroes, that describes the personalities, the people who were instrumental in the history of GPS, from the people who took, they actually gathered signals off of the Sputnik satellite to say, hey, wait, if we know the orbits of the satellite, we can figure out where you are on Earth, to the people who made uh, those satellites a reality. And, and even today, people who are making improvements to GPS, um, there is a group um, the two SOPs is what they're known at Shriver Air, uh, they might be Space Force Base now, who are sitting 24-7, uh, seven, you know, watching and making sure that those satellites continue to operate and continue to provide those amazing signals to us day to day. Wow. All right. Well, thanks to the military very much for uh, for giving us GPS. And we'll put the uh, links to those articles or a mention of those articles down in the uh, in, in the section down below. So that's that's very interesting. So, um, you know, we have as, as the United States, we operate the GPS uh, constellation. Are there other are other countries operating their own GPS constellations? Yeah, several different countries operate their own constellations. They're all grouped together under a heading called Global Navigation Satellite Systems. So you have uh, Russia, their GLONASS system. You have China, Baidu. You have India, NAVIC, NAVIC. You have Japan, QZSS. And South Korea is rolling out its systems as well. Um, and you know, the European Union has something very comparable to GPS and very closely aligned to GPS called Galileo. And some of those systems are actually global systems that are just like GPS. Other systems like Japan's QZSS is actually designed for the Asian region. And they put those satellites in specific orbits with places like Tokyo in mind. If you've been to Tokyo, it's extraordinary. It's, I highly recommend a visit if you haven't been already, but lots of tall buildings. And when these satellites are traveling so far away down into um, down to the earth, they hit buildings. Sometimes they can get lost and never make it to your receiver. And I am sure that's happened to some people, whether you're in a mountain or in a city that you're like, where's my signal? I need it now. Um, so Japan has come up with a way to help mitigate those uh, particular signals by putting their satellites into this orbit that's best for their particular region. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Great. Uh, you know, good to know there's so many other systems out there as well. Um, although I believe we were the first, um, so our, you know, good, good, for, good for our military. Um, yeah. And you, you had mentioned earlier um, that GPS can provide information other than just location. Uh, so what are the other parameters that the GPS is good for? 
Yeah, well, knowing exactly where you are located is called positioning. Boom, that's where you are, this spot on this particular earth. But one of the most um, important applications that really doesn't get talked about a lot is timing. Each satellite has on board an atomic clock. And the atomic clock basically uses this, the they measure the frequency of the atoms. The resonance is consistent and it gives you extremely, extraordinarily um, accurate time up to within hundred hundred billionths of a second timing. Wow. And that kind of timing synchronization is extraordinarily important for financial tra transactions. So if you were in, say, the United Arab Emirates and making a, a purchase, it's going to register at exactly near the exact same time at your bank in the United States, for instance, as an example. Yeah. Um, the electrical grid, the um, the way that weather reports are synchronized and sent out together, um, making wireless the spectrum along wireless networks more efficient. And one of my favorites, monitoring for earthquakes, seismic monitoring, understanding where it's at, and then taking the location and combining that timing and location to be able to warn people, hey, something just happened in this particular location. You may want to take cover. Got it. Fascinating stuff. So um, so you, you mentioned the timing can be very accurate down to 100 billionths of a second or whatever. On the location side of GPS, um, you know, how, how accurate can GPS get if you needed super accurate location? Yeah. So um, one of the fabulous things about uh, GPS and in its history uh, when it started was it had a very strong kind of systems engineering culture. And there's actually an Air Force Institute of Technology report that talks about the history of GPS systems engineering culture. I personally am really soft along systems engineering. My first assignment in the Air Force was at Los Angeles Air Force Base, working in the systems engineering division. And we um, making sure that different components of a larger system could talk to each other seamlessly for the user. And another key component of that are standards. And there are two standards that have been issued that guarantee, that say the Defense Department's gonna guarantee this level of performance for GPS. They're, um, the signals that they provide to the military and allies. And then the one that we think of more commonly is the performance a standard for the civil signals. And they're about, there are more than 15 different ways you can measure performance, but roughly um, what the standard commits to providing is equal to two meters or 6.6 .6 feet. In practice, the performance standard that they've come up with is actually less than one meter around 2.1 meter. Now that's GPS alone. When you're transmitting signals that far away down to the Earth's surface, you have to go through the atmosphere. There are a number of different errors that makes that signal really faint, fainter than a light bulb by the time it gets to the Earth to use a commonly used example. Um, so different organizations have created augmentation systems. Some of them are satellite-based, such as the ones that the FAA uses to augment GPS signals to use for aviation. Some of them are ground-based, which commercial companies have implemented um, to try to get much more precise uh, levels. For instance, um, precision agriculture, another cool one for a girl from Missouri. Okay. Most of those large farms have, whether it's on a John Deere tractor, you put Trimble equipment on existing farm equipment, they're getting their precision down to one to two centimeters. And why is that important? For a farmer, that means that you can plow, uh, weed, harvest, so much more efficiently, it, you know, you can almost let the tractor move or the harvester move on its own, but it saves water, it saves the use of pesticides and herbicides. You're getting the precise amount of seed that you wanna put into the ground, which saves a ton of money, there are environmental benefits. And if you've ever been on a farm, I noticed at my great aunt and uncle's dairy farm, you don't have enough time in the day 
So precision agriculture also gives time back to farmers that they can focus elsewhere in all of the amazing amount of work they have to do just to run a particular farm. And those, aug those ground-based augmentation systems help do just that. Okay, interesting stuff. Uh, great. Um, so we rely on GPS for all of these great applications and, and you know, for, for decades now, it's provided us with a great service. Um, but it has been pointed out, like, do we rely on GPS too much? You know, what happens if, if the GPS satellite goes, uh, constellation goes down for some reason? Should we have a backup for GPS or, or a backup for satellite based navigation system and systems? And if we should, um, what would that backup look like? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, there's also questions about a backup timing capability that do we need that given the its applications to critical infrastructure like the power grid. And I'll be honest, I am, I don't know the answer to that question. When I was in the Air Force, I was so proud of this program I ran called Backup Dissemination or BUD. And it was extraordinarily valuable if you have something like critical infrastructure that's relying on a particular signal, you absolutely want to back up. What I learned from being um, responsible for BUD was that it costs money. It costs extra money. And it's also a separate baseline that requires people and documentation and maintenance to go along with it. So if you are willing to invest in in that backup capability and do it well and make sure it's a true backup to make it happen great when budgets are being cut when there's you know a step back and you've created this backup system but you haven't really made sure your primary system is is whizzing along you know at top speed as best as it could then you don't want to be stuck with a shortfall in bu budgeting for your backup system when you haven't actually made your primary system the best system that you can. Got it. There, there's a lot of talk about complementary position navigation and timing systems, particularly in space. And uh, in fact, GPSIA member companies have invested in those companies. We've been testing our receivers about uh, to take a look at their signals to see how they how they operate with those signals. And so there's a lot of energy behind that um, those complementary systems. Got it. Yeah, very pragmatic answer, right? If you're not going to go full in for a full replacement, it doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. It just takes resources away from your primary. So very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, so on, you know, what does our, what does the future of GPS or global navigation satellite systems in general, what, what is that looking like right now? You know, I do think that those complementary systems will come into play at some point in the future. I think they're, they are down the road, you know, it takes a while, not just to build satellites, but to get FCC approval to operate those satellites, to work through the International Telecommunications Union process or ITU process. I do think those systems will, will, um, will come along and be nice complements to GPS. The Defense Department has GPS in its baseline. It is the program of record for position, navigation, and timing, and we're grateful for that. It's an extraordinary system with an ex just incredible infrastructure located around the world to monitor those systems, make sure they're operating properly, make sure they're delivering those signals to the standards that they have openly published and made available to others. So, uh, you know, the future is bright for complementary PNT. It's bright for GPS because there just is not a world without without those types of signals. Whether um, whether you're working and living in up in the United States or traveling around the world, you need access to that kind of. We just we just don't function with paper maps anymore. We don't, you know. That's just. I love them. They're great and they're beautiful. Some of them are works of art, but that's just not how our world works anymore. We are yeah. in the future. 
yeah, we were uh, wondering in the, you know, on a drive the other day and realizing that, you know, our kids don't know anything about the old days when you got lost, you had to pull over and pull out a paper map. You had to hope you had a paper map and then you pulled it out and tried to figure out where you were. Um, so let me ask you the million dollar question since we are sort of a spectrum focused uh, yeah. podcast. Um, what are some of the challenges that GPS, GPS faces um, from a radio spectrum perspective? Yeah, we are always on the lookout for interference related impacts to GPS systems, whether it's JSON band or in band. And right now you've read the news, many people have read the news, hearing a lot about jamming, less so about spoofing a GPS signal, but jamming those signals, particularly in areas of conflict. Um, basically people are buying cheap devices off the internet or making their own cheap devices. They're not that difficult to make and they're transmitting at, you know, blasting them and they are drowning out the signals that are coming from space. And so the receivers can't hear that signal. And that is extraordinarily dangerous, especially in public safety uh, ways. It's really difficult in conflict areas um, when you're relying on those for precision targeting. Um, and so jamming and spoofing is a huge, huge problem. In the United States, it is actually illegal to interfere with GPS systems, and the FCC actively pursues uh, people who are found where, whether there are interference issues. The Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Coast Guard's Navigation Center takes reports from people who, who say, something's wrong with my receiver, something's happening, and they also investigate. But the fact of the matter is you can still find them available on the internet in the United, accessible in the United States. So the FCC has a huge job to try to address that jamming and spoofing issue just alone in the United States, much less addressing it globally. Wow, interesting. All right, well, we certainly don't want all that to interfere with all the great things that GPS does for us. So um, yeah. yeah, very fascinating discussion. Uh, we are just about out of time, so we have to wrap up the episode. Uh, Lisa, thanks very much for joining us. Fascinating information from the GPS Innovation Alliance. Um, I hope the Alliance continues to successfully guide us on all of the key areas where GPS impacts our everyday lives. And uh, thank it, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Andy. Really appreciate this. It's great talking to you. Great. Thank you.